airway breathing circulation and obviously in early urgent antibiotic therapy is key uh, we are not uh, talking of a baby who is clinically stable we are talking of a septic baby so within one to two hours the antibiotic should be within the baby system so you have to have a system in place where your pharmacy and your uh, nursing staff link up the moment the prescription is there the drug should be processed quickly there shouldn't be any delay in antibiotic therapy uh, supportive treatment is important. Uh, you may need to uh, nurse the baby in an incubator if you have the facility as it serves as isolation as well. Uh, the staff should follow isolation precautions. Contact precautions are very important. Uh, ventilation may be needed if the baby is uh, very sick or the respiratory distress component is high. Uh, you would have to treat the shock. I know many of you are... Uh, uh, getting well versed with POCUS and you can use the ECHO as a guide to I mean, decide on which uh, inotrope to use. Norepinephrine is a frequently used drug. Dobutamine is used as well. If there is PPHN scenario, avoid dopamine. Uh, consider holding the feeds and consider fluid restriction. Many of the septic babies also have uh, syndrome of uh, inappropriate ADH secretion. You may get hyponatremia. So we try to avoid... Uh, excessive fluid in these situations unless the baby is in shock and you give saline boluses. Very important to monitor the urine output as well because these babies may be underperfused and you may have uh, pre-renal renal failure. Uh, if you are on TPN, you may reduce the dose of lipids during the acute phase. A platelet dysfunction can happen as well or the jaundice may rise. So keep uh, 2 gram uh, per kilo per day of lipids in such cases. Uh, remember that you may need a longer duration of antibiotic therapy and IV access may be a challenge. Again, these babies may be in ill per oral for a few days if you're suspecting NEC. So consider uh, central line access where you can. Uh, you shouldn't run out of cannula sites and you have to complete the course after that. You have to initiate the broad spectrum antibiotics and antivirals as appropriate and you have to rationalize the antibiotics once you have the culture report and the clinical response. So this is a rough guide of the duration of treatment. And uh, remember that these guidelines were formed many years ago and not much change has happened in them. The antibiotic uh, duration is usually from the first day of symptoms, but uh, some sources say from the first uh, day of negative culture. Obviously, uh, if you have a positive culture, we do uh, repeat the culture to get a negative culture. But most of us in practice, we follow the treatment from the first day of treatment. If you have changed the antibiotic according to the culture report, then we continue the antibiotics from that uh, date of our sens sensitive antibiotic unless you're downscaling. So for GBS sepsis, uh, we have uh, 7 to 10 days and 14 days for meningitis. And E. coli or gram-negative sepsis, again, uh, 14 days and 21 days, which is almost standard. Uh, same applies to uh, staph aureus. So 14 days for uh, both sepsis and meningitis, but most of us give up to 21 days. And if there is osteomyelitis or septic arthritis, we give up to 6 weeks. Coagulase negative staph, as I said, most of us do not do the lumbar puncture unless the baby is really sick or neurological concerns. But again, the duration of treatment is similar. And candida, again, uh, the bag organism can be difficult to eradicate. So even for the candida positive culture, you uh, do 21 days for both sepsis and meningitis. And for meningitis, you often add uh, fluconazole and flucytosin as well. So just a brief overview of antibiotics. All of you are familiar that uh, the antibiotics can be bacteriostatic where uh, they don't kill the bacteria, but they prevent their multiplication or bactericidal, which are the stronger, more potent antibiotics, which uh, kill the bacteria. And you can have broad spectrum or narrow spectrum. And you have the different antibiotic classes. So aminoglycosides, cephalosporins, tetracyclines, and so on. We have the different mechanisms of action. So we have a couple of slides uh, detailing that. So basically you have the cell wall inhibitors. So the penicillin, cephalosporins uh, will inhibit the cell wall synthesis. The carbapenems as well uh, inhibit cell wall synthesis. Sulfur drugs are not much used, but they inhibit folate synthesis. The fluoroquinolones uh, inhibit the DNA replication by inhibiting DNA gyrase enzyme. The Tetracyclines, macrolides, and aminoglycosides all inhibit protein synthesis. So you have the uh, lincosamides like clindamycin, which inhibit protein synthesis as well. And uh, of course, in the Indian scenario, we have a lot of drug resistance. So we have to be all very responsible in how we approach antibiotic treatment. So the WHO has classified antibiotics into three categories. 
We have the access group like ampicillin and gentamicin, which are the first or second choice antibiotic. They are the best therapeutic value and minimize the potential for resistance. We have the watch group, which is the second choice. Most of the time you would go to that where you have specific infections you want to cover. The third generation cephalosporins and some of the newer aminoglycosides, ciprofloxacin, these are all in the watch group. The reserve group is a last resort like meropinum and uh, co colistin, polymyxin, and so on. So you don't want to use these drugs unless vancomycin as well. So you don't want to use these drugs unless you have a clear indication. So these are examples of the uh, access and watch antibiotics as well as reserve. So these charts are available and you can get this information online. But I gave you some examples as well. Uh, Linozolid, for example, comes into the reserve category as well. And the fluoroquinolones are in the watch category. Macrolides are in the watch category as well. So we have uh, examples of these. And vancomycin is in the watch category, while uh, linozolid is in the reserve category. We have different levels of uh, drug resistance. So you have uh, these classification of antibiotics. So aminoglycosides, carbapenems, cephalosporins, fluoroquinolones, uh, antisodomonal penicillins, monobactams like astreonam, and uh, phosphonic acids, phosphomycin, and polymyxin like colistin and polymyxin B. So we have uh, multidrug resistance where you have uh, resistance to one agent in three or more of the antimicrobial categories. So if you have more than three groups uh, which are resistant, it's multidrug resistance. That's the common category, like the routine ESBLs. Then we have extra extreme drug resistance where we have resistance to one agent in all but two categories. So for example, if uh, the antibiotic sensitivity covers these, uh, you have like two categories uh, which are uh, still available. It is extreme drug resistance and you have pan drug resistance, which is something which hopefully we should not see, but we do see some bacteria where almost all the groups, you have uh, resistance to all agents in all categories. So pan drug resistance is the most severe. Multi drug resistance is also bad. And you know the mechanisms of uh, drug resistance. So we have the uh, bacteriophage related uh, multi drug resistance and uh, you have uh, the other mechanisms, genetic mechanisms, plasmid being related as well. So different bacteria, Enterococcus is quite resistant. We even get vancomycin resistance now in 20% or so. Staph aureus, we often see MRSA and vancomycin becomes essential in such cases. Klebsiella is carbapenem resistant in many cases. Acinetobacter, Pseudomonas, uh, which is resistant to ceftazidim and many other uh, agents. And Enterobacter can be resistant as well. So uh, we have the uh, Delhi neonatal uh, infection study in 2016. It's called the Dennis study in short. And they looked at the sepsis burden in four level three neonatal units in Delhi. Nearly 17,000 units were studied. Uh, they had a clear uh, standard protocol uh, in how to collect this uh, culture samples and so on. And uh, obviously they had important results. Uh, this is the organism division. Acinetobacter was found to be the highest uh, prevalence and Klebsiella E. coli were important as well. Uh, the same pattern applied to both early onset and late onset sepsis, which was different from what we see in developed countries. Gram negative is not that predominant. We get GBS, which was hardly seen in this study. And uh, the antimicrobial resistance in the inborn babies, uh, Resistance was reaching 78-81% in the gram-negative infections. Multidrug resistance was very common. Uh, outbound babies reaching 90%. So it was very uh, depressing to see the spectrum of uh, drug resistance we were seeing. So, I mean, this becomes a catch-22 situation because we have any baby with sepsis potentially has a high risk of uh, multidrug resistance. And we have gram-negative infection from the start as well. And uh, the sepsis, as we know, in babies can be rapidly progressive. So how do we approach the situation? How do we conserve the antibiotics? And obviously, a lot of, lot of social responsibility comes in from the community as well. Most of our colleagues who abuse antibiotics are unwittingly contributing to this drug resistance problem. So as a whole, the society has to change. But as neonatologists, I mean, we are looking at a very small population range, very high-risk population. 
So we, we can't burn our hands. We have to be sensible. But where we use antibiotics prophylactically or where we have to escalate without a clear indication, we can hold back on that. So the less we expose uh, our unit to the higher, I mean, the reserve category of antibiotics, the better it is. So we have different strategies, preventing infections within the unit. Obviously, in the tiniest babies, it's difficult to totally prevent, but we can try our best to reduce the rate of infection. So introduction of simple bundles, training the staff, monitoring and hand hygiene are important. Accurate diagnosis, so don't jump to treat sepsis while it is just a inadequate ventilation that's causing the distress or uh, you have a reflux causing apnea. You have to be monitoring these babies, but don't jump to give antibiotics the moment you see a symptom. You can uh, act accordingly as needed and then monitor the response closely and uh, try to improve your staffing so you can safely monitor the babies rather than saying that I don't have anyone to monitor, so I have to give antibiotics. So use the biomarkers wisely. As I said, I mean, um, if the CRP is 10 on uh, day one, it's very common due to the vaginal delivery itself or slight uh, aspiration. So don't uh, start antibiotics if there are no other risk factors if the baby is clinically improving. Don't escalate antibiotics just because the CRP is rising after 24 to 48 hours because that's a natural trend. If baby is clinically improving, wait for the culture and de-escalate or stop early. And introduce antibiotic uh, stewardship on your unit and newer diagnostic tools which can give you a culture report earlier so you can stop earlier as well. So we have bundles which include rational admission policy. So once you admit to the unit, you often start antibiotics. So first see whether you need to admit the baby. Shorten the length of NICU stay. So kangaroo mother care, uh, parent-led care can lead to earlier uh, rooming in of the baby and even earlier discharge, which is safe. Uh, don't do routine samples, don't do routine suction, so uh, don't do routine investigations unless clinically indicated. Asepsis routine should be inbuilt in all of you. Don't hesitate to tell each other off in the unit. Build a culture where people don't hesitate to uh, encourage hand washing and pointing out if you don't do it. Uh, leaning on incubators or open care systems, touching the baby without washing hands, not removing the wristwatch. As consultants, you have to set the leadership and you the way you do it will encourage your staff to do it properly. If there is a contaminant in the culture, you go back to train the staff or feedback so that uh, it doesn't happen again and again. And rational antibiotic therapy and training of the nurses is key. So we have uh, 12 steps in prevention, hand hygiene and infection control. We'll discuss a few slides later. Stop the treatment appropriately. So many units with antibiotic stewardship, you have a reminder for checking if the antibiotic is needed and uh, know when to say no if it sepsis or not and monitor a few hours more if needed to be clear cut if the baby is not too sick. Uh, don't treat colonization. So many of us have the habit of skin culture or tracheal secretion culture and treating based on that. Invariably, your hospital bugs are going to be present there. So it will be multidrug resistant bugs in the colonized areas. So very rare that it gives you a clear benefit. If the baby is symptomatic, you treat them with broad spectrum anyway. So don't uh, test these secretions in the first place unless you have very poor clinical response. Uh, use the local data for sensitivity and practice antibiotic stewardship and other control measures. Don't hesitate to ask the experts if you have multidrug resistance and uh, target the specific pathogens and uh, step down as well when you get the culture reports. Don't keep the meropenum going when you have something which can respond to ciprofloxacin or uh, piptas, amikacin, and so on. Uh, get the catheters out and central lines out at the earliest. So uh, standardized approach to feeding helps you do this as well. So teach your team not to hold the feeds when there is a small aspirate or uh, I mean, don't uh, check the residuals unless you really mean to understand how to deal with it. Vaccinate uh, as appropriate as well. So in terms of the accurate diagnosis, the blood culture sampling is very important and try to get the sample in blood culture. There is no excuse for not taking the culture before starting antibiotics. It's not like the lumbar puncture. Make sure your lab is using good quality media, which can get the reports faster and uh, incubate at 37 degrees before uh, transfer. If you are keeping it in the fridge, it will uh, slow down the bacteria growth. So it's not going to give the results faster. And remember that 60% of the cultures are negative. So you cannot rely on just the culture. If the culture is positive, it guides you. But if the culture is negative, it doesn't rule it out. That's why you have to go with the overall picture, even in your 
decision for uh, lumbar puncture. You cannot base it just on a negative culture that I won't do the LP. And uh, you have to clean the skin for a minimum 30 seconds and use alcohol, iodine or chlorhexidine. And uh, avoid the open system of collecting from the hub. Ideally, you should uh, take with the needle and visit the microbiology lab to understand their process as well. In terms of antibiotic stewardship, uh, we have to decide on appropriate choice of the antibiotics. So timely antibiotic is important, appropriate selection, appropriate administration, and de-escalation. So if you have a culture positive with babies clinically improving with negative parameters, try to de-escalate and stop. And availability of expertise at the point of care and data monitoring. So uh, if we have carbapenemase producing bacteria, uh, you have uh, many units in India using colistin with uh, carbapenem like meropenem. And of course, you have polymyxin, colistin, tigicycline, nitrofurantoin, phosphomycin. So most of us are getting familiar with these drugs, which we hardly knew 10 years ago. That is because of the very high incidence. The cephalosporins hardly work. And uh, that is why the choice of which baby to treat becomes important. And when to escalate, it becomes very important. Uh, I know it's a very uh, difficult balance when you're actually with a sick baby and you have to answer to the family as well. So it's the community and the family together that we need to balance. And you could use a combination of colistin with tigicycline or colistin with aminoglycoside. I'm, I mean, I'm sure uh, we, we are not far from the time when the resistance to these drugs will happen as well. So unfortunately, we are in a very uh, difficult situation as a vicious cycle. And we don't see any clear solution for this problem. So you can see here in India that the watch the access group is only in a very small percentage of babies that we start. Majority are going to the uh, watch group of antibiotics, which are supposed to be restricted as well. And the reserve group is used in a significant number. This is even lower than what you'd expect. So probably the reserve group will be around 30 to 40% as well. So we have a very high use of uh, the broader spectrum uh, reserve group of antibiotics. And unfortunately, uh, we have reached that stage because of careless use in the community. Uh, all the GPs, all the other colleagues are to blame as well because the community incidence of drug resistance is huge. In developed countries, in the community, it's usually a sensitive bug. In the hospital, it's a resistant bug. So the nosocomial infections come from resistant organisms, but the community bugs are usually sensitive. But in India, even in cattle and so on, I mean, the abuse of antibiotics has led to even the uh, community acquired bugs. That's why early onset sepsis with ESBL or uh, I mean multi-drug resistant bacteria is very common in India.